Hey yo guys, um, I really didn't want to make a video like this to come back to, but I feel I personally must, um, I would have either way, but I mean, it's obvious the fact that one of my, my personal favorites to see, whether it be WWE or TNA or his tenure in all Japan, uh, passed away today, and that would be uh, Edward Fatu, or otherwise known mostly to people as Umaga. Uh, really, this is, this is really sad, um, basically what had happened is, you know, came home from the Hulk Hogan Australia tour, uh, you know, comes home, you know, obviously a couple weeks ago, but anyways, he's home, he's watching TV, his wife covered him up with a blanket, guy had a heart, he had a heart attack, obviously, during that point, as he wakes up in the morning, and he's got, you know, blood coming out of his nose, they're rushing him to the hospital he's in intensive care take it put him on life support eventually take him off life support and then you know six eastern he passed away at the very very tender age of 36 this this just really sucks for me like personally i have so much respect and i'm such a fan of the samoan uh, wrestling uh, family the anawaii family and to me he was he was just so talented um, you know, a lot of people were comparing him to Yokozuna from the fi the same family, and you know what? He basically was just a another version of that, maybe even better, because he could keep the weight down. That was something that you know Yoko couldn't do. He was actually doing not you know trying to take anything away from Yoko, but that was obviously Yoko's big problem. He could not keep weight down, and uh, Umaga or Edward Fatu, whatever you want to call him now, could keep the weight down. Now, of course, you know the one thing I think this is sad it's more likely he had the heart attack from you know drug overdose you know drug you know taking too many drugs and stuff and that's and the, that's the one re reason he got released from the wwe this year was the fact he refused to you know go to the uh go to rehab because it was strike two on the wellness policy for him he's like nope and they're like well unfortunately we have to fire you like they really didn't want to but they had to stick with their policy and they did and that's just, you know, sad. It's like if someone could just, if he could have just done that, we probably wouldn't be seeing people making these videos or making these their tweets on Twitter about, you know, their memory of Umaga. I mean, or any other form of uh, inter, uh, social networking. Uh, we wouldn't have had to have that happen. That's the one thing that strikes me. Um, when you look back at the man's career from afar, like, you know, from basically his whole career, you know, not obviously not just WWE, you could, the thing that basically sums up with me is the fact that he's a big man that can go. And I'm not talking, obviously, tall, giant. I'm talking, like, the more wider type of wrestler. And that is a very rare thing in pro wrestling. And he's one of them. He could go. And I, I think it's more the fact that, you know, he's from the Samoan culture. And those guys, all, like, all, everyone, basically, in the Anawai family can go to some form. You know, I just loved watching this man perform. Like, some of the things he would do for a big man just absolutely blew my mind. Um, when you look at him, you know, going on the top rope, he's up there like he's a freaking luchador on the top rope. Uh, just splash down on people. Just absolutely a phenomenal sight to see. And just some of the uniqueness to his moves. Um, whether it be, you know, the move where he, you know, send you off the rope and just uh, flapjack you up and he catch you and put you in a, a Samoan drop. Absolutely incredible. I always used to think, what a cool move someone could do, and, you know, he, he would do it. He, he could do that. Um, you know, looking back on the career, though, you know, obviously he started out with uh, his cousin, Matt, who was, of course, uh, Rosie. And, you know, they were in a HWA, which is the uh, Heart for Wrestling Alliance, which was WWF, Developmental Territory. He eventually got brought up with Three Minute Warning, which really, that's a great spot for a guy to come up with you know you're the general manager of raw the, you know put him with eric bischoff who is a predominant uh, character on the raw show back in 2002 2003 and they put him on there and you know he pretty successful for a while it kind of didn't take off to the height that i think the company had and what a lot of people had for it it was just they had that one match with billy and chuck and that was about it like sure they were in the rumble um unfortunately for Edward, he got fired over a incident where he had a fight in a restaurant, was fired, decided to go to TNA, where he used the uh, he used the name of uh, Akimo uh, down there. He was a tag team wrestler with uh, Sonny Siaki, which was a really good tag team in their own right. Uh, you know, pretty good 
great team to work with. They never really got went over anyone. They were more of a team to get teams over. They feud with America's Most Wanted. But they were a very good team to watch. Um, you know, Sonny Siake is a guy that I still feel is a very underrated guy who hopefully can maybe make a return to wrestling um, since he gave up a kidney. But anyways, yeah... I was a big fan of that tag team. It worked really well. Unfortunately, his tenure in TNA was just really cut short as he got opportunities to uh, go work to, in Japan for All Japan Pro Wrestling where he went back to the name Jamal. And a short little tag team there for a while uh, before he hit it big with um, Taiyo Kiyo, who is a big star in All Japan. And very successful team. You know, they won one of the uh, tag tournaments down there in Japan and even won, I believe, the all, I believe it was the All Asia Tag Team Championships, which were, I believe, are the oldest tag team championship belts in Japan's history. So that would, that was, you know, really cool for him. And I thought, you know what, All Japan would have been a perfect place for him to go since uh, WWE, when WWE released him this year, instead of just, you know, per specific independent dates, you know go back to All Japan. Because with the All Japan stuff that he did back in 2005-2004 uh, made him a much better worker than when he was back, you know, with Jamal and in, in, with 3 Minute Warning and stuff like that. So I just thought it was a perfect place. And, you know, hopefully, well, one of my things is that, you know, WWE realizes that they need another territory and one preferably international. They're big. They got. They actually have a good connection with Dory Funk. Dory Funk has good connections. All the all Japan send some of those guys over there. But that's besides the point of this video. And then of course, you know, he leaves all Japan as he got the opportunity to come back to the WWE with the Umaga character. And in hindsight, this character, like when you think about this character on paper in 2000, fucking the new millennium, this character should not work. It shouldn't. It's a stupid you know, character that we're supposed to believe from when we're, like, you know, the, the savage from Samoa, that shouldn't work. But only a once-in-a-lifetime performer could pull it off, and this man did in Eddie Fatu. He was able to pull it off so well. Um, you know, they debuted him right after WrestleMania 22 with a big angle with Flair. And, you know, you just think, well, it's how long is this going to last? Probably going to forget about it. No. They went out and built him as a monster, like, like something you don't see them do that much anymore. They built him up as a monster... And it's just, ah, oh, just the stuff they, like, that character had just so much to it. Not only just for him, but it brought back a predominant manager in uh, Armando Alejandro Estrada. You know, that's something we hadn't seen in wrestling for so long. And they brought it back, and of course, because the WWE's WWE, or we can't have managers getting over, so that just basically happened. But, you know, without Umaga, I do don't know how well this uh, John Cena's tenure or run as champion would be. John Cena and Umaga were the two perfect people to get in the ring together as opponents for Cena's first, uh, you know, big run as the new guy, you know, with the belt. You know, whatever he was doing on SmackDown after he beat JBL was really nothing. A couple of rematches that were okay, but goes to Raw. This, you know, I, he had matches with Angle and stuff, but this to me, was the, the matches that set him apart, where you could tell, hey, he's getting it in the ring. The match that they had at the Royal Rumble was fucking incredible. Um, just the falls, the bumps they took, it was a, a false count anywhere match, I believe, and it was just, oh, just an unbelievable match. Just the stuff they were doing, and it's just like, that was the match, I think, that I for sure did, and a couple other people did, but I think the whole wrestling spectrum should have seen Cena's going to be successful as a in-ring worker, and, you know, without Umaga, he, you know, Cena wouldn't have been catapulted to the, the level that he was, and Jeff Hardy as well, and, you know, because Jeff Hardy and Umaga had some of the most fun matches you'll ever see, I mean, there's matches that you see are just bad, there's matches you see that are fantastic, but, like, if you just are bored and want to watch a match for, like, you know, five, ten minutes, pop on a match between Umaga and uh, Jeff Hardy, it's just fun stuff. Um, of course, before his big matches with Jeff Hardy, he had, he basically, he main evented WrestleMania 23. It was the most, it's the most successful WrestleMania of all time, and he's a part of the biggest, a part of the main angle to make it the most successful WrestleMania of all time, the hair versus hair, uh, Donald Trump versus Vince McMahon stuff, which, hey, it was something that we fans now have got to take chances with the young guys. Well, they did, with a big angle with, you know, Umaga and Bobby Lashley, and people say that match is just pretty shit. I think that match is, you know, pretty decent um, for what it was. Of course, the match really didn't get 
as enough time it did because the main event had to go long and but still i thought it was a good match you know they continued the feud for a while and they had pretty good performances as well and then of course he had the stuff with jeff hardy which was just absolutely incredible um i think the match for me that just sticks out you know while the cage match she had on raw that basically set up you know it was to help set up jeff versus well, randy at the, the Royal Rumble, Randy Orton for the Royal Rumble, the Royal Rumble for the belt. You know, Umaga was the guy that that helped get Jeff super super over us. He was taking the insane spots that Jeff was doing, and just ah, uh, just this man was just so talented. I mean, Umaga is basically the reason that there was a heel turn of Santino Morella from I believe Night of Champions 2007. We just squashed him, and people were more into that. You know, without the Umaga character and him being just such an incredible work, I don't think the com that company would even have certain characters and dynamics that they got going today. And I think we owe a lot of that to Eddie Fatu. And of course, he was released at the end of this year. You know, he started to get injuries before that. You know, he had a big PCL tear. You know, he's going to come back, have this feud with Undertaker, violation, and, you know, he gets hurt again comes back is a pretty good feud with CM Punk. I really would have wished it could have gone a bit longer, but obviously they're building up Punk for another title run and eventually a heel turn. I don't know where they would have they probably would have done the Undertaker Umaga stuff, which I would have just absolutely loved. As I think those would have been very successful matches. They wouldn't have been I don't think they could would have been Vaderish where Undertaker and Vader just couldn't click. I think Umaga and Undertaker would have had just some chemistry out there that wouldn't be forgotten in decades. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, he had a, a, a wellness strike violation before that, obviously, it was one of the reasons he went away, and then he had another one, and then he's just, the WWE, of course, was like, please go to rehab, we'll bring you back, and he, he's like, nope, and then he gets released, he was, worked a couple indies, he recently, like I said, worked the Hulkamania tour in tag matches, uh, mainly against, uh, I believe it was him and Orlando Jordan, mainly against Scotty Tuati and uh, Ken Anderson, or Mr. Kennedy, so... Yeah, that was that's that's Umaga or Edward Fatu, um, a man that I think really we need to remember um, and just watch back some of the stuff. Just like I said, like the stuff he would do off the top rope, the matches, and just think back to the importance of like without this guy being there, I don't know where we would be with certain people in the company. So really, that's all there is for me. Um, so Edward, peace. Uh, going to really miss you. Huh? I'm pretty sure there would have been hope of him coming back to the companies. I think there was, but no, no, that's never going to happen. Just 36. Like that's just the saddest of the saddest. Um, you know, that family lost another, a great talent very early and that when Yoko Zuna and now they lose another one. I don't, I hope to God that there, there you know, more than likely there will, but I hope to the good Lord that we get another talent just as good as, uh, Edward fought to. So anyways, that's it for me. I am out. Peace.